Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about the King's Gambit. Uh, starting after e4, e5, we're going to be talking about the King's Gambit beginning with the move of pawn to f4. Now this is going to be the first part of a five-part series talking about the King's Gambit. Uh, this video is going to be exclusively focusing on just the main lines of the King's Knight's Gambit. Uh, we're going to have our own video focusing on how to play against the Counter Gambit. Uh, we're going to have a separate video focusing on how to play against the Declined. And we're also going to have a separate video on after e takes f4. Uh, we're going to have our uh, this video's focus is going to be on the King's Knight's Gambit. We're going to have another video on how to play the King's Bishop's Gambit. And after the King's Knight's Gambit, we will have another video just dedicated to sort of the odds and ends of how to play against the King's Knight's Gambit. If people try the Cunningham variation or the so-called modern defense. But the main focus of this video is just going to be the moves pawn to g5 and the so-called Fisher defense, the move pawn to d6, and how exactly we should be meeting those uh, with the white pieces. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button, click on that notification icon. So first, let's just get into the concept behind the King's Gambit, is white gives up this pawn on f4, and in exchange for that, he has a better center. He has two center pawns, and black only has one. And so he's going to utilize that better center in the hopes of playing a move like pawn to d4, developing his pieces, eventually recapturing this pawn on the f4 square, getting a huge attack uh, down the f-file, and just having a general big advantage. That's kind of the concept, is there's this long-term potential to have an advantage in the middle of the board with the white pieces. So that's what led to kind of the two main defenses of the position, uh, the first and foremost of which was just the move pawn to g5. Later came, of course, the Fisher defense. And of course, the reason the Fisher defense came about is because of this game that we're going to show. It was uh, it was uh, Boris Spassky versus Bobby Fisher played in Marlboro Plata back in 1960. And of course, uh, Fisher included this game uh, in his book, My 60 Memorable Games. It was one of his three losses that he included in that book. And uh, this is what led him to try to come up with a better defense than pawn to g5. And we're going to discuss that in a minute. But the main idea behind pawn to g5 is to hold this pawn on f4, not just because it's an extra pawn, but because it's a shield, because this pawn is shielding the whole f-file from attack. And actually, this is one of the ideas of the modern variation as well, where people play d5 with the idea of just at some point playing bishop d6 to hold this shield. Although playing bishop d6 right away is a little imprecise, but again, I said this is going to get its own video, it will get its own video. <laughs> so, going back. Uh, pawn to g5, holding this shield, holding this pawn on f4. This is the idea. So white needs to sort of break up uh, this shield pawn. Now, in Fisher's book, My 60 Memorable Games, when he was talking about uh, uh, this game that he had against Boris Spassky, he mentioned that the Muzio Gambit didn't have a lot of magic in it anymore. Uh, he said that after bishop to c4, the position had been analyzed to a draw. After g4, castles... Uh, takes on f3, queen takes f3, queen f6, and he didn't give any details after that. He just said it leads to a draw, which is not, like, true or anything. Uh, it's actually still very complicated. Uh, and I'm not even sure, like, which, uh, what draw he was referencing, to be completely honest. Uh, the main line here is e5, queen takes e5, and now, of course, the main line is bishop takes f7 which, in fairness, might not have been a move they were familiar with back in 1960. Uh, I did find a game from back then that maybe Fisher was referencing that continued with d3, although d3 is a little questionable. And that game was uh, Minnick versus Sokolov, played back in 1961. And it did lead to a perpetual, but it was by no means a forced perpetual. It wasn't like a forced repetition or anything like that. They just ended up repeating moves at some point they ended up shuffling their queens back and forth but uh, at no point does it appear that it was forced uh you know stockfish doesn't confirm that the moves were forced really for for either side you know they could have just played for a win uh so not sure exactly what he was referencing there and again the main line in the muzio is like bishop takes f7 and these lead to wild complications, which always seem to lead to a victory for either white or black. And actually, white wins his fair share, more than his fair share in this. White does a little bit better than black does. Uh, but all that being said, I would actually recommend against uh, this Muzio move order, uh, this bishop to c4. Uh, but for a different reason. I'm not at all worried about the move point to g4. The main thing that I'm worried about is if black just does something simple like bishop to g7. 
because I don't really have a great counter for this move. Um, and in the making of this video, this was one of the things that I really wanted to cover sort of right off the bat, was this move bishop to g7 is a really good way to counter this move bishop to c4. Uh, the whole point is, is we can no longer break up uh, black's uh, pawns. Like if we play move like d4 and then say d6, h4, h6, and that's it. This position slight edge black. We don't have a great way to break up the pawn structure of black, which means we don't have a great way to get rid of the shield, which means that black should have some sort of slight advantage. And this was actually getting to this position from either the g5 move order or the Fisher defense move order was one of the things that I really enjoyed doing as a young player when I was playing the black pieces. I was a big proponent of playing the Fisher defense with black uh, when I played the black side of the King's Gambit. Um, so anyways, going back, what happened in this fischer spassky game? Well, Spassky wasn't going to allow uh, bishop c4, bishop g7, followed by, you know, h4, h6, or whatever. He was just going to hit with pawn to h4 right away, and this is still certainly the best move. We really don't want to play bishop c4 and allow bishop g7 with the idea of black just kind of holding everything together and we just can't break through. So after h4, g4, Spassky played knight e5, and then we had Fischer play knight to f6. And now here's where things get kind of interesting. We have this move from Spassky, pawn to d4. And now Fisher does mention in his notes uh, the move that got played by Paul Morphy. He mentions this move knight to g4. Now what's interesting is, uh, for purposes of this video, I actually recommend this move knight to g4. I think that the way that Paul Morphy played this going all the way back to Morphy versus Anderson, uh, played back in Paris in 1858, I think was completely reasonable, which just shows, in my opinion, like how good Paul Morphy really was, uh, that he was somehow following very closely to Stockfish. But this is, of course, the second strange piece of analysis that I get from Fisher in my six memorable games. Uh, after knight g4, Fisher mentions this line in my six memorable. He says knight takes e4, and again, we're also we're following Morphy versus Anderson, Paris, 1858. Uh, d3, knight to g3, bishop takes f4, sacrificing the rook on h1. And for whatever reason, so many players were critical of this uh, of this line. Uh, it's basically forced. After knight h1, we have queen e2 check. And then we have queen e7, knight f6 check, king to d8. And then here's the idea is we win the queen. We play bishop c7, king c7, knight to d5 check, king d8, knight e7, bishop e7. So white has a queen. And black has two pieces and a rook for it. And the position is extremely complicated. Now, for whatever reason, just about every strong player that came after this, like, you know, guys like, you know, William Steinitz, um, you know, uh, guys like uh, Bobby Fischer in this game, where in my six memorable games, he analyzes this line and he says, and black should win. Now, if you look at this on an engine, the engine just gives the position as roughly equal and it's actually extremely unclear and i'll just show the game that morphy had against anderson because believe it or not morphy was pretty much on the money with his moves uh, he played queen to g4 pawn to d6 and then we have queen f4 we have rook g8 which is rightfully given an exclamation mark it might be the best move in the position played by anderson and then morphy just went for it he played queen takes f7 and what's interesting is it's not clear that there was anything wrong with queen takes f7. It's actually a really good move. And actually, Morphy played the black side of this position as well, and his opponent failed to play queen f7. His opponent played the move knight to c3, and then Morphy battened down the hatches with bishop e6. Then Morphy did eventually go on to win with black. So he kind of won from both sides of this. Uh, but Morphy played queen takes f7, just taking this pawn, preventing the anchoring of black's pieces. And uh, then we have this questionable move, bishop takes h4. So now we have this analysis again from Meroxi uh, that says Meroxi thought that this was, again, all these guys, they all think this is somehow major advantage black. Uh, Meroxi thought that rook f8 exclam was the correct move. And he gave this line, uh, which is weird. He gave queen takes h7, knight to g3, knight to d2, which is by no means forced. Bishop e2 is also possible. Like bishop e2, bishop f5, queen g7, knight e2, king e2. Knight d7, knight c3, bishop takes h4, knight to d5, rook e8, check. King d2, bishop e6, rook h1, and then say bishop d5, rook takes h4, king c7, g4 with this very dangerous pass pawn is just like slight edge white, according to Stockfish. So bishop e2 was a reasonable alternative. 
Now, going back, though, even in the line he gave with knight to d2, uh, we have this bishop f5, which he simply gave as decisive advantage black, according to Meroxi. According to Stockfish, queen g7 is slight edge white. <laughs> so, uh, I just, you know, there, there's some, some disconnect here on kind of the reality of what's going on, which is it's difficult for black to finish developing his queen side. And the fact that there is a material deficit here, you know, in favor of black. Black has two pieces and a rook for a queen. Two pieces and a rook should be worth more than a queen. But if you can't develop your queen side, that's a problem. So there should be some kind of compensation here. Um, so anyway, so this line is uh, totally reasonable. Of course, that's not what happened in the Fisher game. Uh, in the Fisher game, we have g4, knight e5. Uh, we have knight f6, and then we have this move from Spassky pawn to d4. So now we're going to have d6, and then knight back to d3. We have knight takes e4, bishop takes f4, bishop g7, uh, knight to c3. And actually, Fisher, I mean, everything being said, like, Fisher did pretty good. I mean, he should have, it should, this should just be slight edge black. Like, black should have a slight uh, advantage here. But he made some further mistakes in the game. Uh, so it continued, uh, knight to c3, b c3, uh, c5. Uh, we have uh, bishop to e2. Uh, c takes d4, castles, uh, knight to c6. And things didn't really... Uh, what, what's interesting is things didn't really go badly until almost the very end. Uh, you know, Fisher's doing really well here with black, and he's doing great. And things didn't go badly till the very end um, after... Okay, so just showing the continuation of the game. Bishop to g4, castles, bishop c8, rook c8, queen g4, uh, pawn to f5. We have queen g3, dc3, rook a e1. Uh, king h8, uh, king h1, rook g8, bishop d6, bishop f8, and uh, he holds everything with rook to g7. Fisher plays rook to f5, and then basically Fisher just kind of blunders here in a move. After queen h4 check, king g1, uh, Fisher plays the move queen g4, and basically just missed a shot. He missed this move uh, after rook, rook to f2, uh, bishop e7. He missed this move rook to e4, queen to g5, queen to d4 rook f8, and then rook e5. So this was the shot that he missed. And actually, even up until rook f8, Fisher was probably okay. Even here, he just had bishop f8, and after, you know, something like uh, queen takes a7, uh, bishop d6 should just be equal. Fisher should be fine. So Fisher was okay for, for the vast majority of this game, just kind of messing it up right at the end. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, playing what he needed to play, just completely missing uh, this threat of rook to e5. And of course, after he missed that, after rook to d8, queen e4, queen h4, rook f4, uh, this was the point, is uh, the queen is basically running out of squares, you know. So after rook f4, for example, queen to g3, we would simply have rook e7, and uh, that piece was no longer defended by the queen. So the queen has to go to a square that is no longer defending the bishop, and that's a problem you know the queen is holding the mate square all the other threats are held after rook e7 uh, queen e7 white is comfortably up a piece so he didn't like this he didn't like the fact that spassky had something that at least looked like pressure he didn't like the fact that he didn't have a clear way to convert his advantage so he basically changed things up he said you know look i don't like allowing g5 h4 and then allowing this knight e5 line where white can play d4, and even though white is still probably slightly worse in this position, black doesn't have anything clear to get his advantage. And again, I don't necessarily recommend d4. I think Morphe's line is perfectly acceptable. I think knight g4, at least according to Stockfish, is supposed to be completely equal. And this is actually what I recommend people try here, is try this line that was played by Paul Morphe all the way back in 1858. This line is probably still good. <laughs> There's probably nothing wrong with knight to g4. But anyways, uh, he didn't like the fact that white could play d4, and that's why he came up with the Fisher defense. Now, the Fisher defense and g5 uh, share some commonalities, which is if you play d6 and white just tries to play something Muzio-esque, you're going to end up in a very similar situation. So, for example, let's say, uh, let's say bishop to c4 or d4, and then they play g5, and you just play something, uh, something unaggressive. 
Like instead of h4, which is the main line, you just play something unaggressive, like you play this move like bishop to c4. So now you're going to see uh, quite a few similarities to the old main line. As soon as black plays bishop g7, you're going to see h4, you're going to see h6. And this is just quite simply put going to be slight edge black. You have no way of breaking down this shield. Uh, and the same can be said if you take other move orders that don't put direct pressure against the Fisher defense. You have to sort of break down that pawn structure in the same way that you do in the main line. You have to break it down some way and do something quickly before black has a chance to establish g5 with bishop g7 so that he can meet h4 with h6. So d4, g5, you need to play h4 right away. And again, if you don't understand why, like, like you can't play h6 here, if you play h6 here, this pawn is actually pinched to the rook. You would actually lose the rook on h8, in case you were wondering why it's critical that black gets in both g5 and bishop g7. So here, when you play h4, you're really threatening to take this pawn, and there isn't a great move for black other than simply pushing it. You're going to have to play pawn to g4. So this leads to uh, the main line, and it also leads to this other possibility. And what's interesting is I'm actually going to recommend this other possibility. Um, the, the main line is just knight g1. And I've got quite a few stem games here that are kind of interesting, uh, starting with knight to g1. Uh, I have knight g1, bishop h6 is a move. Uh, and apparently the main line is supposed to be something like knight c3, pawn to c6, knight on g to e2, queen f6, and then g3. And I'm actually following a game uh, that Nigel Short played against a Copian. Uh, that continued f takes g3, knight takes g3, bishop c1, rook c1, queen h6, bishop d3, and I guess eventually Nigel Short went on to win. But there were quite a few mistakes in this game, and not only were there quite a few mistakes in this game, even beginning with f takes g3, it's a little questionable if f takes g3 was even forced. Um, f3 is certainly a possibility, and we at least have one example of that. We have Tandy versus Solomon played back in 1994. They continued with knight to f4, knight to d7, and then we have king f2, and then apparently just queen e7 here would have been like major advantage black. So bishop h6 seems like enough to just be slight edge black or even major advantage black. And also, uh, not just bishop h6, but maybe queen f6 is also enough. Like we have this game, um, you know, Gallagher versus Fontaine, uh, that I guess went well for Gallagher, but apparently uh, Black was probably uh, winning at some point, like probably had a huge advantage. Like knight c3, knight e7, knight on g to e2, bishop h6, queen d2. I guess the idea is just to get this pawn at all costs. And now just knight on b to c6 is what was played in this Gallagher versus Fontaine game. Although Gallagher outrated Fontaine by like, you know, 300 points uh, or more. Uh, but apparently black had an advantage like after knight b5 king d8 d5 uh, we had knight e5 queen c3 c6 dc6 knight c6 this should just be major advantage black uh but after uh bishop d2 pawn to f3 and f3 is still apparently okay castles queen side fe2 bishop e2 you know white's position is aggressive even though he's worse uh, we had this mistake king e7 which left the king kind of in the firing range but if he just simply played a6, apparently white has nothing. Like after rook hf1, bishop d2 check, rook d2, queen e7, knight d6, the king's can sidestep everything with king c7 and can hide over on the queen side. And that's probably just, you know, he doesn't have enough experience getting in attacks. I mean, you know, he was rated, I think Fontaine was 2150, Gallagher was 2485 playing the white pieces. So uh, if you've got experience on how to sort of survive these attacks where your king is still in the middle of the board and you need to find shelter, you kind of have a better idea on where to put your king. And uh, he kind of put his king in the wrong spot. Um, so anyway, so going back uh, to all this stuff, I think this knight g1 move is not great. But what's interesting is maybe there's another possibility here. Uh, we have this game Morosevic versus Kasparov played in Paris back in 1995, which, you know, initially when I looked at this game beginning with this move knight to g5, I thought this was a little strange. Like, like knight g5 seemed odd because, of course, it sacrifices the knight seemingly for nothing. But after king f7, bishop f4, the position is very Muzio Gambit-esque. Um... But Kasparov just absolutely crushed Morosevic, beginning with the move bishop to g7. Now, what's interesting is the computer gives bishop e6 his best. 
And what's equally interesting is in both cases, it's not clear that either move fully equalizes for black. Uh, but Kasparov played bishop to g7, and Morosevich played uh, bishop to c4 check, which seems to be correct. And then we have king e8, and then we have this move from Morosevich, which was castle's kingside, which was apparently a big mistake, uh, which you can never make against Kasparov, because Kasparov will take full advantage of it. Apparently, uh, after this, Kasparov played absolutely correctly. He played knight to c6, bishop e3, and then queen takes h4, and uh, this position was just advantage black, and uh, white was unable to recover, even though it still looks optically a little complicated. White should have played, instead of castle's kingside, the move knight to c3, and then after knight to c6, he would have bishop e3, knight f6, queen d3, and this position is still pretty unclear. Uh, and we actually have a few examples of where this could go from here. Uh, we have this move knight to b4 uh, that actually got played in a game. Uh, we got this game at Sens versus uh, Gonzalez, which, interestingly enough, black won, but at some point white had an advantage. Uh, it went queen d2, pawn to d5, e takes d5, knight on b to d5, and then castle's queen side got played. But here, this is the case where castle's king side would have been better. Uh, castle's king side exclam would have been advantage white. Castle's king side, knight c3, b c3, queen d7, rook a to e1, uh, king to d8, queen to d3, uh, queen c6, bishop f4, bishop d7, rook e5, rook f8, and then rook to c5, which would have been a decisive attack for white. So this was another interesting possibility. So all that being said, probably this line isn't all that bad. Like, you could probably play this sacrificial continuation beginning with knight g5, knight takes f7, and after king f7, you should have something here. Uh, the only other possibility is after bishop f4, they could try the computer best line with bishop e6, and I came up with a very interesting fantasy variation here uh, that continued knight to c3, knight f6, bishop d3, knight h5, pawn to d5, bishop to d7, uh, pawn to e5, knight takes f4, pawn to e6, check, uh, king e8, castle's kingside, knight to d3, queen d3, queen h4, and now g3, queen g5, knight e4, coming into the f6 square, uh, with the idea that after queen g7, we're going to play rook f7, queen to b2, knight f6 check, king to d8, and then rook e1 should be a completely winning attack. Um, and the idea is after bishop e7, finally now the computer sees that it's losing after rook e7. And of course, this is one of the cool reasons that you play things like the king's gambit is you get these crazy lines where the computer thinks you're lost, and then you get to the end of it, and all of a sudden the computer thinks you're winning. You know, so it's just kind of like these crazy, wild attacking lines. Uh, so I'll just finish off with what the computer recommends. It recommends queen f6, rook f7, uh, bishop to b5, queen to b5, queen f7, uh, e takes f7, knight d7, queen b4, and this is decisive advantage white. So in summary, and I know this was a long video, this is like a 23-minute video on how to play just the king's knight's gambit. Uh, in summary, what you want to do when you play the king's knight gambit is after f4, e takes f4, uh, knight f3 and then g5 you want to avoid scenarios where they're going to play bishop g7 and then be able to meet h4 with h6 so you have to break up this pawn structure right away with a move like pawn to h4 so the two main lines that i'm recommending here are going to be uh, the immediate pawn to h4 against g5 and then after g5 we're going to have uh, knight e5 knight f6 and then i actually recommend the morphine line with the immediate knight takes g4 and then against the Fisher variation, again, to avoid the setup involving g5, h4, h6, where they have in bishop g7, you need to play d4 right away, and then after g5, break this up immediately with h4, and then go in for this wild gambit with knight g5, h6, knight f7, that is apparently totally reasonable, uh, and white should be okay in these lines. Uh, so anyways... Uh, if you liked this, please uh, hit that subscribe button, click on the notification icon. I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.